Hi, and welcome to the Build and Exit podcast. I'm Judy Wilkinson, and I'm the owner and founder of Wilkinson Accounting Solutions. Uh, We specialise in business acquisitions and exit planning, and we started the podcast to give tips, top tips and guidance to people who are looking to sell their business or people who are looking to grow by acquisition. So I'm really excited today to have Steve Brogan as our next guest. Hi, Steve. Hi, Julie. Steve has been running his own um, entity for about 15 years and is the owner and founder of um, Ascot Group, which he's been part of for three and a half years. And through that entity has transacted in acquisition. So um, I'm really excited to have you, Steve. I think you're going to give great tips for our listeners today. Uh, So first of all, let me hand over to you to give a little bit of a background about yourself. Okay, so Steve Brogan, um, I left corporate um, 15 years ago to to set my own business up, a drinks wholesale group called Drinks 21 Group. Uh, about 10 years later, I wanted to get back to a, a passion of mine and something that I'd done professionally before, which is mergers and acquisitions, and co-founded Ascot Capital with Steve Pratt. Three and a half years later, we've bought five businesses. We have well over 100 staff and a and a thriving group, but that has come with some some very interesting learnings and challenges uh, that we've come across along the way. Oh, yeah, so with that, I think a key topic we're going to talk about today is team structures, because I know you've mentioned to me before about um, some of the acquisitions you've taken on have had good management teams in place um, and others maybe didn't have quite as good. So it's something I see quite a lot in acquisitions when we work with people is, you know, who are the teams going to run the business? Because like we always say, investors want to buy an asset. They don't want to buy a job. So I suppose if they're looking at businesses, how um, how are these people in their due diligence process going to work out? Do we think it's got a good team structure and what money might they need afterwards? So let's start with good. So I know you've said you've bought a couple of businesses that you think did have a good team structure. What What do you think made up that foundation? I think I think on the on the best experience we've had is where the where the vendor or the principal shareholder you know created a a structure where he was already relatively hands off in the business. Yes, he he controlled the finances to a degree and and uh, and the investments, but the day to day management was already delegated to you know really capable person. Um, that person had some equity. In the, in, the, in the business as well. So it was very motivated. And so when we came to take over, effectively we stood in the, the majority shareholders shoes and there was very little or no uplift for for the staff. Um, yeah, the, the minority general manager was very motivated to, to come as part of our group. Yeah, we made sure that he got the right incentives to, to stay with us. And he's, you know, he's used the fact that we're a, a bigger scale player to to grow his business and uh, and really motivate his staff so i, I suspect the, and i hope that the vendor thinks he's got a good deal um we've got a, an excellent deal because you know the business is performing exactly as we thought it was and i think we've invested nicely behind the staff because we had a very motivated general manager to you know to deliver the plan that we wanted to yeah and do you think i mean i don't know if you ever talked to the seller about it do you think he had planned to exit? So do you think he had set it up like that so it would make an easier exit? I think I think that was probably, yeah, he was planning for at least a couple of years. I, I would suggest that, you know, with COVID and, and the, in the, in the industry that we're in, you know, COVID was a very positive period. So he had a, he had a, a COVID bounce and probably took that opportunity to, to accelerate his exit. But, yeah, it was definitely a clear plan on his part to to make sure that you know he wasn't required in the business post sale, and you know for acquisition vehicles like Ascot Capital, um, that's off. Yeah, you know, that's probably the better way for us to work. We want to get in there with our own teams and our own people to you know to invest in our asset, and often you know vendors you know, see, see change as, as an undoing of their, of their lifetime work. And that's not what it's about, really. We're there to, to grow the business. So the fact that he was ready to exit and could exit quite cleanly made it a really, really easy acquisition for us. 
And as um, sort of founders and CEOs, I know you've got a few other people as well. Did you have to do much work yourself in that business or did it actually run well from the day one of acquisition? Whether that be you or another, someone you put in that you paid on top of the current staff level? No, I mean, you know, we we as directors manage manage that business directly. Strategic input only, you know, operational input, very, very limited. I think the GM's you know, been motivated by that. We've invested in, you know, some, some quite quick wins around upgrading IT, um, some cosmetic um, infrastructure investments, and making sure the retail stores were um, you know, modernized. But fundamentally, you know, it's been a, it's been a super investment for, for us and uh, very little operational stress. And that's mm. if if you're if you're looking for that kind of investment, then make sure that you've got that management team ready to go in there, or already in there. If you if you're looking for that kind of relatively passive investment. Yeah, and how often are you reviewing the finances then in that business? Are you doing it sort of weekly or monthly? So we have a monthly, yeah, monthly finance re- review. Um, all the businesses have certain KPIs that they're measured. There's a budget. You know, we have a group FD that you know obviously sets those targets and budgets and and, and manages the you know, the financial reporting side. Um, and then we sit with this GM on a monthly basis. Um, you know, subsequently now we have a group MD in place, so you know he reports to her. And um, you know, so my you know our role as founders is even more hands off than it than it was. So yeah, it we we're obviously monitoring it, but. You know, we're, we're trusting the right guy to to run the business and do and do a great job and and, and continue, you know, the the growth that he's already put in there for us. Yeah. So so that sounds really good. So then, if we reverse flip it and look at one that you've bought that maybe didn't have as good team structure in place, what do you think the differences have been? I think um, there's, you could probably list two or three. Um, is the is the vendor really ready to sell, or does the vendor still want to play an active role? And if and if they do want to play an active role, how receptive are they to to change? Because if we're you know we're building a group, you know we we're trying to harmonise processes, policies, procedures, strategy, uh, culture. Um, if you're buying up a number of businesses in the same field, clearly they're going to have different cultures. And in order to achieve those objectives, you've got to get behind one vision. And so is that vendor who is staying in prepared to buy into the new vision genuinely and and, and, and potentially have to compromise on some of the things that in the past, you know, they, you know, they wanted to do, but they've sold their business so they can no longer do it. And if, and invariably, my experience is that's quite challenging for vendors. Um, they don't like to see somebody else coming in and changing, changing the light bulb, so to speak. And um, you know that in that way, that can upset morale with staff when they see that a pre, you know an owner is no longer happy despite selling their business. And so we've had an you know we've had experience where you know an owner was you know particularly unhappy wanted to leave, we allowed him to leave, but still wanted to talk to the staff and would write to us periodically saying, I think you should be doing this, um, but he sold his business. So so in that regard, I think it's important that you're very clear what your, your expectations are of that vendor and going into the negotiation, not at the end. So if you want to run the business in your own way and you don't want any input from the vendor, then I think... It's important that you're clear from the the get go that you know that there is a very quick exit for that person. Mm. And so, in that scenario, then this is more where the owner is still quite heavily involved in the day to day pre sale, more than like the scenario where the general Absolutely. manager's already running, running the business. In. Yeah, yeah, they were running the business. They were the glue that held a lot of that business together in some regards, and although they wanted to leave because they didn't feel like they could contribute to the new group when they did leave there wasn't 
the management structure in place that we talked about earlier to pick up the slack. So performance, you know, dipped in the short term and, you know, staff were still heavily influenced by that, by that vendor in the background. So, um, yeah, you know, it became a, you know, it became a combination where in the end we've, you know, we've had to change all the management in that, in that particular business because no one could move on. Mm. So you still managed to do it, but I'm presuming you've had to have a bit more investment in it because you've had to replace and maybe more recruitment fees. Yeah, the and management things. time in, in, in resolving that uh, for, for, for the, you know, myself and um, the other, the other shareholders has been significant return on that investment, therefore lower slowed us down in terms of further acquisitions, but at the same time, you know, learned, learned some lessons in terms of not every acquisition is the same. And if you've got, a, you know, if you, if you as a, as a buyer have got a particular goal in mind, you know, how you, how you plan your people needs to be a key part of that due diligence. Yeah. So if someone is looking to buy and they're trying to identify as part of the due diligence process, you know, how active is the owner operator? What, you know, is there some, a key question that you think they could delve into to try and get that information? I think, in, I think with effort, effort, SMEs, you know, even just looking, you know, let's see, let's walk through the org chart. Let's walk through your key people. Um, at some point, the key people need to be aware that there's a sale. It's very difficult to do this all clandestine. Um, and you would interview as part of your due diligence, you know, the two or three key people that are, are going to run that business. I suspect, and where we've done that, it's worked really well. And in the example where where we didn't, because it was a sale that was done through COVID, because we expected perhaps optimistically the the vendor to stay longer, um, it didn't work out for us so well. So, a deal is not just about the balance sheet, the P and L, the deal structure. You know, make it a bit more three dimensional and get underneath particularly when you're buying family businesses that have been run for a generation potentially by one person or or a family um, understanding that culture understanding if is there any key people that can be promoted or already actively in a senior management position that can be embraced in the new in the in the new post sale team um, I think is critical yeah yeah because my last podcast i had uh rachel collar who does who owns house of hr um and as we were talking about people there and the contract side of things because i see so many acquisitions where either the seller has promoted the guy that's been there 15 years um which is great because they're committed to the business but sometimes it's do those people have the skills to run it and also often they haven't then got the right contracts in place and the and the and the law legislation being followed so then when the buyers have it it can cause them problems post acquisition as well um especially when they transfer and two p and things like that do you do hr due diligence as part of your deals we do but it's not at the level that you would want for a you know the scale of business that we are and so you know, you're going into a lot of these acquisitions accepting that you know what's good for a five million business isn't necessarily good for a thirty million pound business, and um, so you have to accept that there is going to be some work around that that area potentially. The you know if I was if I was advising people selling their business, then you know getting getting all your employment contracts up to speed, um, having clear roles and responsibilities for your staff, even if you have to invest in an HR consultant to get you there, will make that post-sale process a lot easier. I mean, often a lot of these deals are involve deferred consideration or earn out where the vendor will want to maximize the ongoing profitability of the business. Well, the way that's going to be achieved without the vendor being there is through the people. So invest in getting the team to the best possible point um, in terms of motivation, in terms of clear goals and responsibilities and a clear structure chart so that post-sale, new vendor in, 
you know, people can carry on doing their job in the way that they were doing it before. Yeah, because I know, I mean, we, we help with financial and ops DD. And the reason we do both is, so like one of the questions, I mean, often the seller will always say, oh, I don't do that much in the business. That's what tend, they say a lot of times top level. But when you actually delve into what they do, they do a lot. So like as an example, one of the things we see a lot is who prices project, you know, services or products. And often it ends up being, it's in the, it's in the seller's head. There isn't a quotation form. So things like that. I mean, if you don't have a actual quotation form that other people could use to price, then the seller is actually having quite a large impact in the business because they're basically the decision on the margins. And so we then think about what impact does that have to financials? Because there is, well, will someone quote correctly after acquisition? Because if, if it's in someone's head, how do you know it's right in the first place? But also who will do it? Um, so you can't always fix everything pre-act, to be honest, because you the, the business you're buying is where it is. You have to make the, you know, sometimes you have to make the call. But I think it's important to know the potential cash impact of that and also how lo- long will it take to implement your own strategies? I mean, did you find that in yours? Did it take longer to implement strategies than the one that had a poorer management team than the one that was running more, more without the vendor after acquisition? Yeah, 100%. I mean, we... You know, we spent the best part of 18 months, you know, making sure that we just had the right people in there, the right structures, the right basic processes. Business contracted quite significantly. Um, so, yeah, whereas we've actually done what we should have done in, in, in the successful business, which is brought our buying power, our, our marketing skills to grow that top line. And so, and we have, we've grown double digits in that business year on year with in a recession. So, uh, you know, outstanding effort by that team. And we've contracted significantly in the other one um, because, you know, we've been firefighting on the HR front almost since, since we bought it. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? So, well, thanks for your insight, Steve. It's been really interesting. So, I mean, what's the f- long-term goal for you now? Have you have you got a, f- a future plan for the acquisitions and what you want to achieve personally? So for Ascot Capital, we've got um, at least one further acquisition lined up for this year. We've been very, you know, to stay on this theme, we've been very clear with, with our expectations of the vendor in terms of their role post-deal. And, and they're happy with that. So everything has been very clear and transparent up front in terms of their role and time that they will stay in the business thereafter. And then we're probably looking to, you know, to do at least two a year um, for the next couple of years. Our target is to, we're currently at 12 trade, trade counters in our, in our power tool division called Territory Group. And our target is to get to 25 in the next two and a half years. And you know, see where this journey takes us from there. Okay. So, are you? So, if anyone, are you looking for off-market deals? If anyone needs to contact you, are they best to come through LinkedIn or? Yeah. So LinkedIn or ascotcapital.co.uk. You've got all our acquisitions on there. Um, you can contact either myself or the co-founder Steve Pratt. Uh, Steve is responsible for the you know the acquisition side of the business. So yeah, if there's off-market deals or people even looking, thinking about selling, and you know potentially just want a little bit of of help, um, then you know I'm sure we can you know we can give some help to somebody looking to sell or or even someone looking to buy if 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 that's if that's what we can do. But definitely looking to to keep buying in this space. I uh, think it's potentially very lucrative and um, it's a great sector to work in. So you know really enjoying diversing from drinks into into the construction industry it's been good fun oh good well thanks so much and um thanks to all our listeners i hope you're enjoying our podcasts if you really like them hit the subscribe button or rate and review us at apple so more uh listeners can find our show and i hope to see you again soon 